Hey, this video is going to be about some of the impacts of technology and the impacts of computing and we're looking at the issues that affect stakeholders of technology. So stakeholders is just a term for anyone with an interest in your subject, whether it's positive, negative or neutral, just anyone who's vaguely involved and with technology it's so prevalent that that's pretty much everyone. So we're going to look at four specific issues or categories of issues and people often overlook this topic but it's so important and it's good because you can kind of come up with your own ideas especially if you're well informed of these sort of things but there are some talking points you should really know and some theory as well to do with legal stuff in particular so make sure you stay tuned till the end or skip there if you want to if you're comfortable with the first three but let's start by looking at some ethical issues first which is all about whether something is right or wrong. Privacy is a great example of an ethical issue, so to what extent do we have a right to privacy as citizens? And there's often a trade-off between our security and our privacy, i.e. protection of our private data. The government needs to keep us safe, that's clearly their main role, but that often means that we have to look at personal data in order to you know, detect crime in early stage, detect terrorism and so on, which a lot of people don't like. People are very wary of government surveillance. So I could be recording this at any point in time, there'd be loads of examples, and one recently as I'm doing this is the Home Secretary is basically told large technology companies they should effectively reduce their encryption or at least allow the government a way to decrypt data so that they can catch things like um, terrorists before they actually commit the crimes. And I think in 2014 the FBI wanted to have access to an iPhone by basically getting uh, Apple to bypass their security system. Apple refused because they thought it would undermine their system and it sets a bad precedent even if this was a one-off case. Eventually the FBI got in anyway so that kind of suggests that something wasn't quite up with Apple's security system, maybe it was weaker than it should have been. And on a larger scale you have mass surveillance by the NSA and GCHQ of their citizens. Clearly they'd say it's for security, but most people feel kind of uncomfortable by that idea. There are tons of ethical issues clearly, but a second good one is all about inclusivity, making sure technology is inclusive. So to what extent does computing marginalise people? So as technology becomes more prevalent in our society, it may negatively impact people who can't adapt as readily to this change. So people like the elderly, people who are disabled, people who are in poverty, so certain countries that just don't have the infrastructure, don't have the money to spend on technology, they may get left behind in the world economy. And on a kind of individual level, people who are perhaps not used to this technology may not be able to adapt as the world around them does. And finally, professionalism is something you could talk about. So does computing help in a work context? Does it make people work better? Does it make people work more professionally? And just in general, lack of professional skills can cause projects to fail. So these skills being like communication, teamwork, etc. There's often a module in a computer science degree just for professional skill development. And so a lack of ethical training or standards in the kind of computer science community can lead to things which may spiral out of control. So a very drastic step here. But if people don't, Consider the ethical issues at a very early stage, you may end up with things like mass unemployment through just computers taking over most low skilled jobs, and in a very drastic example, maybe AI, which is evil. If people don't consider the small ethical issues, they can kind of snowball. And another example, which is perhaps more related to ethics, is things like plagiarism, the theft of code. An example of a project which went badly due to a lack of professional skills is this NASA orbiter, which blew up in 1999 because one team on the project used metric units of one team used imperial units and fortunately no one died this was an unmanned orbiter but it cost 125 million dollars so a huge project down the drain. A second category we can look at are environmental issues related to computing so first of all health so how is our physical and mental health affected both really important up until maybe five ten years ago only physical health would be really considered but now mental health is much more uh, important in the kind of public perspective so you may the initial kind of reaction to that is perhaps technology negatively affects this but it actually can improve it on a small level obviously in the medical profession technology has made a huge difference but we're more talking kind of on an individual level so perhaps through wearable technologies like smart watches or fitbits allow people to have a better understanding of their body and so how they can improve their health and in the future maybe computer-based implants where little devices are inserted into our bodies as implants and they maybe can help regulate the body and so on but that obviously causes its own issues that you could talk for ages about. In terms of how it negatively affects I guess it's stating the obvious a bit but mental health maybe social media is not healthy especially for younger children and physical health perhaps in general people using technology like again young children can make them less active than they would be otherwise. Energy use is an obvious environmental issue so as you try and get more and more computing power both individually on a single process and collectively 
in just loads of devices worldwide. You also need more and more electricity. Most of this electricity is coming from non-renewable resources, so you know that's a whole environmental issue. And generally speaking, most devices are very inefficient. Maybe your process is only running at one, maybe ten percent of its capacity. If you've got a multi-core processor, so you're wasting so much power. If a computer's got to be on all the time, you just maybe won't be using it. So inefficiency causes way more energy use than it should do. Maybe a less obvious issue is resource depletion in terms of computers specifically, not just about non-renewable resources, but lots of these finite resources are used in trace amounts of so tiny amounts in our devices, things like gold, copper, lithium. They're used in very small amounts, but collectively in terms of all the output of all iPhones, whatever, they're used in huge amounts overall. And because they're used in such small amounts, they're very hard to extract when you perhaps recycle them. And people don't even recycle them anyway perhaps. But even if you could recycle them, it's very difficult to get a tiny bit of gold back. In fact, it's not really worthwhile, but as you add it all up, you're then losing so much gold to landfill, for example. Looking at cultural issues then, which is a very broad and kind of vague category, to be fair, but, you know, social media could be a good thing to talk about. How is it changing interactions in a culture that uses lots of social media? Perhaps it's better at holding businesses or politicians accountable. It's a good way of spreading information, both in a good and bad way in terms of like spreading abuse, trolling and so on. Social media can definitely negatively impact a, a whole culture and as I say it can be used to influence opinions both in a good or bad way depending on your context but even from outside sources like the Russian hacking of the US election that was mostly through a misinformation campaign on social media so you've got to be very careful and it can definitely change the culture. And employment, you can put employment in lots of different categories of these kind of uh, general issues, but this is all about how will technology change the job market? In particular, how will the lower skill workers react? How is that going to change the setup we have in our culture? And on a similar theme, globalism is something you can talk about with cultural issues. As the world becomes more and more connected and so much is shared online, do individual cultures and traditions get displaced by just a generic worldwide community? So globalism is a bit of a toxic term politically, but there are loads of benefits and some disadvantages to globalism, everyone kind of would concede that. Um, so take languages for example, because that's very relevant to computer science. English is the main language for computer science, to program your programming in English, regardless of your native language pretty much, which isn't totally fair, but is somewhat inevitable. So pretty much if you want to work on technology, regardless of where you live, you kind of need to learn English to get far. So focusing on some legal issues, then cybersecurity is probably the main, most contemporary one, certainly. So it's illegal to make any unauthorised access to computer material if you're going to commit further crimes, such as blackmail, so if you collect data, perhaps with spyware, and then blackmailed someone, that is going to, that's breaking the law, clearly. And also, generically, to impair just the computer's operation, so through viruses, hacking, and so on. So this is what makes hacking and cracking illegal, if you have no permission. Of course, if you're doing it as part of a testing team and you've got permission to actually try and break a system, then that's not going to be illegal. Hacking, cracking, we may have covered this briefly in the security video, but they're kind of loose terms. Hacking, at least in my mind, is more about hardware and networks, so getting into a system to steal data perhaps. And whereas cracking is more about software, so exploiting some issues in software like a backdoor or something and maybe creating a key gen to forge a license. So that's, at least in my mind, what cracking is. Maybe a less clear-cut legal issue is intellectual property rights, and the very vague legal definition is that they're creations of the mind. That's what IP is, creations of the mind. So things like inventions, a new algorithm, a new piece of software. And you can take from the patents, copyright, and trademarks. So maybe patents and copyright are more for the actual product itself, whereas trademarks are more for marketing the product with a brand. A patent is a legal document, I suppose, that gives an inventor the right to stop other people making or using their invention. And you have to apply to it, so it's something the government will give you. And it protects how the invention works or what it does by allowing the inventor to exclude others from selling their work. And actually, under UK law, software usually can't be patented. And copyright is just for legal ownership that applies to intellectual property. And you don't have to apply to get copyright, you just have copyright by being the author, whereas you have to actually get a patent from the government. And copyright is all about permission, so if they don't give you permission to distribute a film, it's going to be illegal if you give it to someone else for free. Licensing is all about kind of proving you haven't stolen some copyrighted software. So a software license is either paper-based or digital, and it, it basically shows that you have a right to use software because you have purchased it, or have got permission from the author, which is kind of the same thing I suppose, but they can maybe give it to you for free. So you often have software... A license maybe has a serial number you have to enter to download software and it, it basically will have your name and other details showing you you're allowed to use it. 
So generally, software is protected by copyright unless you have explicitly put it into the public domain. But even if some software is free, you still may have to agree to a software license. And in fact, you do in most cases still have to kind of agree to terms and conditions. Usually at a minimum saying you can't then sell it on to someone else if you've got it for free yourself. And as a category commercial software, i.e. software that's sold, can it either be proprietary or open source. So first of all, proprietary software is software licensed under very strict conditions, usually preventing you from modifying or distributing the software yourself. And crucially, the, soft, and crucially, the source code, I should say, is not available to you as the user. It's already been compiled to machine code. So a compiler is taking the source code and making machine code. The source code is not kind of shipped with the software. So with proprietary software, basically the only thing you can do is use it. You've paid for it, you can only use it. You can't modify it or give it to someone else. The second category is open source software, so this is where the source code is publicly available, it comes with the program basically, and usually the license that comes with it will allow users to do lots of things like modify it, look at the source code first of all, and maybe distribute it. But you can't do what's known as restrict for distribution, which is basically to say you can't sell it to someone else. And due to this very public nature, there's not much point in charging for it, so it's often free. It's not inherently free, this is falling under commercial software, so it could be sold, but there's not much point if anyone can look at the source code. And two good examples of this are Linux and Android.